Welcome to Coast to Coast AM's YouTube channel. I'm George Norrie. Like, share, and subscribe. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and coasttocoastam.com. Become a Coast Insider for ad-free access to thousands of shows you'll really enjoy. Tom T. Moore back with us. He, of course, will be talking about the, the Earth Experiment next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Tom T. Moore back with us has been president and CEO of his own international motion picture and TV program distribution business for at least 24 plus years. During this time, he has co-executive produced several movies and TV shows and has traveled extensively as part of the business duties. He's an author as well. Mr. Moore graduated with a B.A. in business administration from Texas Christian University, served in the U.S. Army as a first lieutenant. Thank you, Tom. And he has been requesting benevolent outcomes for 10 years and has a very keen knowledge of how they can be used in both business affairs and in one's personal life resulting in what he calls the gentle way. Tom, welcome back. How have you been? Great. Thanks for having me, George. Looking forward to this. to everyone. And your books are great. First Contact, Atlantis and Lemuria, The Gentle Way with Pets. We'll talk about everything today. But what is the Earth Experiment? What is that? The Earth Experiment came about because the creator of this universe, and there's trillions of creators and trillions of universes, uh, wanted to see if the four negative energies that exist that no one uh, in any of these universes have ever been able to work with could be worked with. And so he, uh, she, however you want to uh, term it, Mm -hmm. uh, created the Earth Experiment, and uh, it is only in our solar system. It only is the Earth in our solar system. Once you get out past the Oort belt, then you get back into the 10 positive energies that the rest of the universe operates on. So that's uh, that's how it started. Uh, the Creator ha- sent its emissaries to these uh, planets, these ET planets, and said, this is what I want to do, and so I, I want you to start developing a body that could work within these four negative energies. And so they knew how to create bodies, but they didn't really have practical experiment, uh, experience. And so they started with, like, the Lucy and the uh, Littlefoot uh, uh, bodies worked up through the Neanderthals mm-hmm. and Cro-Magnons. And finally, 60,000 years ago, they came, up, they came up with the Homo sapiens. How much of an impact have they had on us? Probably a lot, huh? Oh, yeah. They've, they've been around us for literally millions of years. That's why, uh, uh, you know, you're having uh, all the uh, uh, information about the UFOs. That's going to increase, I'm told, in the next six months to the point where I'm told that uh, by my contact, uh, Antura, he said, have your readers keep their cell phones at hand, Tom, because they're going to start seeing some UFOs really close. I love that. And you think eventually government will really begin to tell us, Tom, what the heck is going on? Well, with a little help <laughs> from from us, I think. Um, I, I've also uh, been in contact with a Pleiadian, and this Pleiadian uh, has a, a group of of three or four of them, and they meet with six countries on a monthly basis. And these are like scientific types, and they're wanting to back injure, in, engineer uh, these crashed UFOs and all. And they all think that they're the only ones that the, uh, these Pleiadians are talking to. But in actuality, the Pleiadian uh, uh, makes sure that nobody gets ahead of anyone else. They're all on a level playing field. Now, when you say you're in contact with a Pleiadian, how, does, how did that happen? Uh, through Antura. Antura is a member of my soul group, and he is an amphibian, and he was born on Nomo, uh, a water planet in the Sirius B star system. And right now, he and his three grassroots first contact team are on a 
a Syrian mothership that's three miles wide and 20 stories tall. Wow. With 11 decks, crew of 900, plus their enemy, uh, their, pardon me, their families, that um, uh, because they live their whole lives on board the ship. And this is the very same ship that uh, went over Phoenix and was known as the Phoenix Lights. So it, it's shaped like a, a boomerang, and it sits up above us about 50 miles high and is cloaked so they don't scare us to death. But there's about 24 other uh, motherships, and they're all taking these readings of these uh, of the effects of the four negative energy. So it's all scientific readings, and they do these on a daily basis, millions and millions of readings. When we see these smaller UFOs, are they all coming from these mother ships, do you think? Yes. Now, the the crap like uh, the saucer shape and all, those are kind of known as scout craft. But they can also control what are known as highly advanced drones, and these drones, one craft can can uh, uh, control about 22 of these drones, and the drones do the work of taking all these readings of not only the land, the water, uh, animals, uh, birds, you name it, plus humans. Tom, when you talked about four negative energies and there's, what, ten positive energies, do they counteract each other? They, they can't really exist exactly with each other. That's why, that's why the Earth experiment came about, because no one in any of these trillions of universes could, uh, could work with, with these negative energies. It was impossible. We're the first ones to be able to do that. Do we have any results from the Earth experiment? I mean, is it working? Oh, it's, it's worked. It's successful. Which is a good thing. Yes. And this Earth experiment will go along for another 7,000 Earth years, and, um, uh, and, and it'll be finished. And we'll all, by that time, have gone back to the planets that we originally came from. Uh, we all came from other planets, which is why when you see these, these movies about Star Wars, there really was a real Star Wars. It lasted for 27,000 uh, universal years, uh, but because Earth years are 10 times faster than universal years, that, that Star Wars lasted for 270,000 years. How long have you been in contact with these ETs? Um, 2008. So about 15 years, going on 15 yeah. years. Interesting. Yeah. And it, it's really gotten heavy in the last year because um, you have to understand, we, we haven't gotten into this, <laughs> I'll touch on it now, but there are 12 parallel uh, timelines. There are 12 parallel U's. So the upper timelines have easier lives and the lower timelines have much harder lives. So as an example, um, Vietnam War did not happen on the upper timelines. So what's happened is that my family on the upper timelines, starting with, say, 11, because 12 is non-physical, um, they visited the Syrian mothership, and they've each, time, each timeline all the way down to timeline 7 has visited the Syrian mothership and shot for 14 days each. And so this year it's supposed to be our turn for us to go up to the Syrian mothership and shoot for 14 days. And when you say Syrian, it's from the Sirius star cluster, right? That's correct. Okay. And this particular ship, I believe, is from the Sirius B star system. Uh, they have people on board from 37 different planets, 39 different types of people, we'll call them, uh, insect beings, bird beings, amphibians, even a couple of reptilians. Um, and I'm not, I know I'm forgetting uh, some, but you get an idea of quite a variety of, of people on board the ship. The 
efforts with the Atlantis and Lemuria. How did that start? Um, 60,000 years ago, the, the ETs seeded both Atlantis and Lemuria with Homo sapiens. Okay. And they tried to uh, help the these people out by giving them free energy. And for the Atlanteans, it was uh, giant crystals known as posers that were magnetically uh, charged so that they uh, broadcast beams of energy, and that's how the whole continent ran, all the the cars and uh, and airplanes and houses and apartments all had this free energy. The problem with it, the Atlanteans uh, went ahead and developed it into weapons of war, and they developed laser weapons based on these uh, these energies. And the same thing happened with the Lemurians. They were given free energy, just a different type, and they developed hydrogen type bombs out of that and eventually both societies destroyed themselves are they happy with the way our planet is ha- is going right now yes because they can see the future they can go to the future and and go to the past equally so they know that the earth experiment is successful and we just have to catch up with the rest of, of this federation of planets where there are 20,000 planets that are members. Tom, uh, back a year and a half ago or so, you wrote a book called The Gentle Way with Pets. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. The, uh, I have found that you can request uh, benevolent outcomes not only for things in your life, but also... Uh, your relationships with your with your pets, and um, uh, I also in in these meditations that I do, um, where I've asked thirty thousand questions in a meditative state, I've I found out that as an example, there is one soul that ensouls every single dog on Earth, and there is one soul that ensouls every single domesticated and feral cat on earth. Hmm. And when I asked, well, what about the lions and tigers? Cat soul said, Tom, uh, we like to share the work. So the book gives you an insight into what we commonly call group souls, simply to differentiate, differentiate, if I could say that, um, from from our souls, but they're they're actually the souls are the same. It's just they have different interests than we do, and and, and just like uh, the soul that ensouls our son, uh, that soul has a different interest than we do. So that's that's how I get into, um, and, and and I speak to snakes so, so, so darn and. Um, uh, all sorts of other uh, types of, of pets, parrots, and and so on, and and they generally tell me that they come from the far reaches of the universe, and that we have not yet discovered that the universe is actually 25 billion years old, not 13.2 or six, whatever they estimate now, and. Uh, the the James uh, Webb uh, uh, telescope yeah. is going to eventually say that it's it's twenty billion. But wow, they, what a big difference! Still, yeah, but they still will not have seen the very far reaches of the universe, which is twenty five billion years old. So, for people who have always wondered whether their pets have souls, you can give them comfort by saying yes, they do, don't you? Absolutely, and. and and when they transition, uh, you can say, I request the most benevolent come for uh, Fido uh, to come back for another life with me. And my guardian angel says, 
Well, we take that to a higher uh, uh, to a higher authority, and it's done. So, in other words, they get the same fragment of that dog soul uh, back with them for another life, and that's that's very comfortable, comforting uh, for people to know that they'll have another life with that dog. It's fascinating. Now, you believe in reincarnation of pets. Do they ever reincarnate into humans, or do they stay as animals? They stay. If it was a dog, it'll stay as a dog. What happens when they transition is that they are guiding, guided along energetic pathways to what are called uh, staging areas. And there'll be a staging area just for dogs. And they are assigned a new birth mother. And that uh, that birth may be in the past, present, or future. So if someone is requesting a benevolent outcome for Fido to come back for another life with them, they can't look say, oh, it, uh, this, this uh, uh, dog is three years old and mine just died. It doesn't work that way. So just remember, whatever attracts you to that animal will be the correct, the co- uh, correct attraction. Now, you had mentioned before the break about these 12 parallel uh, frequencies that are out there. Are they just basically parallel universes? What are they? No. They're only for this solar system. So there are 12 Earths, and uh, timeline number 12 is non-physical because our souls consider that to be the perfect life, and then all the others are physical. So we're on timeline six, we're the middle frequency, which is why I was mentioning a little earlier that timelines 11, 10, 9, 8, and 7 have all visited the uh, Syrian mothership, and now it's our turn this year. Is there anything about what you have learned that scares you, frightens you, makes you uncomfortable? No. The more you learn, uh, the more amazing and, and wondrous creation is. You have to understand, ETs know they're really, truly is a creator, where, because we're veiled uh, from knowing, we don't know whether there's a creator or not. And, and a lot of people say, well, my God is better than your God, and if, if you don't believe in my God, uh, you're not going to heaven. That's, that's not true. I think there's only one God, huh? There is only one, only one, one creator. I use the word creator because that's, that word is, is accepted in all the major religions. Have there ever been wars in space, Tom? Absolutely. The, the Star Wars I mentioned uh, earlier lasted for 270,000 Earth years. My so God. Imagine, yeah, that's it's amazing. Uh, 27,000 universal years. So every single person having a life on this planet uh, in previous lives where they were on other planets went through periods of time when their whole lives were lived in fear that they would wake up one day and see an enemy ship that was about to blow up their sun and destroy all the planets orbiting that sun and the billions of people that lived on, on those planets. And that happened on both sides, the reptilian Dracos and uh, the, what became the Federation of Plants. They played that game back and forth, back and forth. Now, your ET contact, how do they communicate with you? How does it communicate with you? Um, simply uh, telepathically. Um, everyone, and, and anyone can do this, okay, because everyone has what's called the pineal gland in the back of your head, right? And and in the Hindu religion, it's called the third eye, but it's it's your pineal gland, and it acts as an antenna for every kind of telepathic feeling, thought, you name it. And so I receive thought packets from uh, all sorts of beings, but including Antura, and uh, and so that's how we communicate. With thought packets. Fascinating. It really is. Are you glad this has happened to you? Well, it was on my soul contract. Um, 
I, I was shocked um, when I was told, I was about to close off the book back in 2013 on first contact conversations with an ET. Right. And, and uh, you know, he was kept hinting, well, you know, we're going to meet. And, oh, great. That's, we're we're going to get to meet. And, yeah, and, and you're going to get to fly in my, my scout craft. Oh, fantastic. Can I take some, some photos? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and finally, it was like uh, using the old proverb, hitting, hitting a donkey over the head with a two-by-four. He said, look, Tom, your family is going to come up to our ship, and you're going to shoot for 14 days, and, and you're going to have the complete run of the ship with the exception of the uh, uh, engine room. And uh, we're also going to show you videos. They have been videoing our whole experience for over a million years. And they had these little bitty drone cameras that operate in a, at a frequency just above our ability of our eyes to see them. And so they have captured on video every single major event that's happened on Earth. Since you've been doing this, and you've been doing it for some time now, I mean, where's the future here? What's next? Well, when after we we go to the ship, um, we're going to shoot enough footage for one and possibly two feature-length documentaries. You're going to do and a documentary also, on a UFO mothership, and they're going to let yes. you? Yes. Wow. We're, it's going to be a four-camera shoot. and um, You'll see ETs uh, running around and everything? Yes. And Fascinating. We're going to look at their art, their music. Uh, all the we're going to have interviews with all the different types of ETs on the ship, uh, thirty-nine, and each one of those will become a uh, one episode of a series. There's going to be at least one hundred episodes. We're going to look at Neanderthals, and we're going to look at at the history even of religions, which is going to be pretty controversial. And um, so it's, uh, that's, that's the plan. This will be the first documentary done with ETs, won't it? Yes. That's fascinating. What do they look like, Tom? Well, they're all different, as I said. And, as as and, we've uh, always yeah. thought, the, like, alien greys, humans looking, the, everything like that? Some of them, yes. Reptilians? So, and, Antura is uh, amphibian. Um, as I mentioned, they have bird beings that that have a bird presence. They have insect beings. Oh, they have plant beings. If you can imagine an intelligent plant walking down <laughs> the corridor, I mean that's going to be kind of different. And and these two reptilians, the reptilians, the war finally ended. There was a uh, what they called the Great War, there they finally came to a peace accord, and, um, and and so these two reptilians on the ship are looking uh, and and watching the people that have reptilian souls. As part of the peace agreement, ten percent of all the souls that are having lives on Earth have reptilian souls. This is fascinating stuff. You said a four-camera shooter, so you're going to bring four camera people up there with you? It's going to be my family, yes. My, my daughter has a degree in, in film um, uh, in a, from a university in Los Angeles. I won't mention which one right now. And, um, uh, so, and I've co-executive produced some super low-budget movies and films. And um, uh, which is going to be needed because it's just going to be, be us and, and the cameras and uh, not much else. What's your dad, daughter think of Daddy who deals with ETs? <laughs> I try and shield my, my family from all of this. Um, you know, this is, um, th- this is something that, that they're going to be immersed in for the rest of their lives. Because I've already told, been told, 
that my son and daughter will return in 10 years and I won't I won't be with them because I will have transitioned by that time. Now whether it will be of old age or whether it will be um, violent because there are going to be millions of people that are going to be uh, uh, just despise me for for telling the truth about their religions. I don't know. Tom, there's a directive called the Earth Directive. What is that? The Earth Directive came about after uh, Atlantis and Lemuria uh, destroyed themselves. And they and all these uh, Federation of Planets, these 20,000 planets, got together and said, hey, look, uh, we're going to have to leave them alone. They're going to sink or swim on their own. We're, uh, we obviously contributed to having two societies destroy themselves, and so we're, we're not going to, to help them whatsoever. So everything that, that we invent is going to be on us. They're not going to give us anything. Fascinating. It, it really is. And what do your friends say about this? Uh, well, you know, they <laughs> they know me for who I am and and what they, I've been. They accept uh, this. Yeah, as, as far as close friends, yeah. But um, uh, obviously, <laughs> one of the nice things is that uh, you know we are in the international uh, film distribution business, but we're located in the. Uh, the DFW area, so we're not in Los Angeles, so I, I don't uh, hobnob with other distributors. Or In May, I'm doing a, a live show, and one of my guests will be Travis Walton, and you know the name, of course, who was uh, beamed aboard a ship, and uh, mm-hmm. his logging buddies, everybody passed lie detector tests, is telling the truth. It's truly a remarkable story. How many people like you, Tom, are on this planet who have this kind of contact? Not too many, I don't think. I'm, I'm an old soul, and and I wrote my <laughs> ticket, so to speak. I was this spiritual amphibious leader on Nomo, that water planet in the Sirius B star system. And during the Star Wars, um, I suggested that they offer uh, the reptilians. Uh, to have 10% of the souls take part in the Earth experiment. And they hated the uh, reptilians so much because of all this very long war, they, uh, they, they said, no, no, that won't work. And so another 450 universal years went by, and, and we weren't doing very good. The Federation sounded like it was slowly losing the war. And so finally they said, okay, we'll try this, and they accepted. And so after that, they, the Federation said, well, you're going to be one of our advisors. Let's talk a little bit about Atlantis and Lemuria, Tom, before we go to calls. Tell me about that situation. Okay. <laughs> Where do we start? Okay. Exactly. Where do we start? Okay. Atlantis, 30,000 years ago, there – there was a line of volcanoes that bisected the continent of Atlantis, which was in the Atlantic Ocean. And they all exploded at the same time due to the pressure of the plates uh, going together. Tectonic and, plates, yeah. Uh, right. And uh, the, uh, they exploded, and most of the continent disappeared at that, at that time. And... The seas rose a hundred over 160 feet, uh, drowning everyone, not only that lived on the continent of Atlantis, but all around the world. When these huge tsunamis tsunamis came uh, crashing in and uh, wiped out every single village, town, and city all around the world. Now that was the first really big dis- destruction. Then 12,500 years ago, that's when the uh, Poseidians and the Aarons started warring, and the Aarons uh, did a 
uh, Pearl Harbor type sneak attack and use these laser weapons and uh, a million and a half people died the very first day of the war but eventually all the islands sank so that was the uh, and that that happened 12,500 years 500 years ago and that was also when the story of Noah came into being because that actually happened then uh, the Lemurians uh, uh, 7,500 years ago, uh, decided to bomb each other and with these huge bombs and destroyed their uh, continent. How close did Plato have it? Well, Plato actually had access to some documents or these, uh, what do you call them, uh, script things. I'm calling them the wrong thing. Um, that his grandfather got from Egypt. His grandfather had traveled to Egypt and had bought these uh, uh, documents, and they're actually in a basement still somewhere in Athens. Oh, really? Boy, That's they'd be right. worth a fortune today, huh? Wouldn't they? And um, uh, so that's that's where his story came about. People keep saying, oh, that was, you know, he was alluding to the politics of the time, but but it wasn't. He was he was really talking about what he had read in these old parchments. You've got a weekly newsletter that you publish with conversations from your ET friend, don't you? Yes, and and others, my guardian angel and all. It's free. It's my gift to the world. Don't charge for it. You can go to my website at that www. Uh, uh, dot the general way book dot com and on the first page you can sign up for uh, for the uh, newsletter and how often are you chatting with them I try and do it a couple of sessions a week um, they're typically an hour and a half to two hours I can't go more than about two hours because I lose my concentration Interesting. Okay, let's go to the phones. Uh, this hour is going to blow by real quickly. First time caller, Drew in Omaha, Nebraska with us. Hi, Drew. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good to have you with us. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, you know, just staying up a little bit later and listening to the radio. So um, It doesn't get any better, Lou, do, Drew, does it? No, not at all. Uh yeah, I got a question. So have you ever been on, like, a UFO or spaceship, I guess? Tommy, but have you? I have not, no. Not yet, anyway. But you will be when not you do this documentary, right? Yes. Exactly. Are you, you looking forward to that? I am. It's it's uh, been promised for a long time. And, um, uh, you know, as we got closer and closer, I kept asking questions, well, has Timeline 8 been on the ship yet? Well, has Timeline 7 been on the time, on the ship yet? And that's, that's uh, Timeline 7 was on last year in, in, in 22, uh, I think somewhere around May. Have you ever asked them about their propulsion system, how they travel? Yes, they, they call it portal hopping. And um, they're, they're like uh, bending space and time, aren't they? Yeah, and and there there are these energetic pathways between planets and also even between galaxies. So when they portal hop, they can't go from one end of the galaxy. Um, pardon me, one end of the universe to the other. They have to do what's called portal hopping, where they'll go from one galaxy to the next to the next. Next up, speaking of next, Mayat's in New York City. Welcome to the show. Hello, Mayat. Good morning, gentlemen. How fascinating. I had just picked up, and I had some comment and a three-parter, and Tom, I, I listen over the air. But I just picked up a book that I lucked on, and, and Amazon can be brilliant in that, and it's called The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. Uh, that's done and by when, Craig Campobasso. I'm a friend of ours. Absolutely. And when I got it, Tom, and, and I, you know how you read the back first, 
And somebody we know named George Norrie had the most excellent and pithy, he said, the go-to book on life in the universe. So the first part of my question is, are you familiar with it? And, George, please bring Craig on soon because he actually lays out a number of species. So my questions would be, um, are you familiar with the book? And if you are, are the illustrations, do you feel they are pretty accurate? And he, he gives such an excellent breakdown in terms of the um, uh, the uh, universal the species. origin, the physical, the belief systems, the cosmic agenda, uh, technology, consciousness, and dimensional abilities and capabilities. So... Uh, it, it, it's just such a fascinating book that I have picked it up before I even knew you were coming on the program. My other comment is, is when you're talking about Atlantis, I had just read the book of secret wisdom, uh, the uh, prophetic record of human destiny and evolution by translated from the Senzar, S-E-N-Z-A-R, very, very, very ancient language by Zinovia, Daskova, a Hungarian professor and scholar, and she had just described what happened to Atlantis vis-a-vis -vis your comment in that knowledge without love is dead. So any comment on that? But you seem to, I surmise, that you have extraordinary psychic ability. So if you have any tips for those of us who, you know, want to work on that and better intuition. And the last part would be what books and 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 films do you recommend? I recently discovered Amazon Prime, which I haven't used, has loads of UFO and, you know, ET films. So as I get on board with that, your recommendations and suggestions are greatly appreciated. Thank you, George. Okay, you can take a few of those if you want, Tom. Go ahead. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm not familiar with that book. Um, uh, I can only go with the descriptions that Antura has given to me of of uh, a lot of the beings on board uh, his ship. And as I say, his ship is a Syrian ship. So as an example, the Pleiadian ship, which is not quite as large as his ship, according to what the Pleiadian told me, um, they, you know, they have a lot of different beings. I always thought that the first... Uh, people that we would meet that would be ETs would look like us uh, because there are Pleiadians that look just like us with exception maybe of pointed ears. And um, uh, so I was really shocked when I, when I first started talking to Antura, thinking that he was going to look like, uh, like us, and it turned out he was totally different. <laughs> and um, so that's, you know that's kind of what I've I've had to go on, and and so it'll at least be a start for us uh, to show us that there are many different kinds of beings uh, out in the universe, and if there are that many types of beings in the Sirius B star system alone, can you can you imagine what the rest of the universe will hold for us? Do you have any psychic abilities? Uh, not really, my. I ask questions, uh, and I'll I'll receive predictions from when I ask questions because people from all over the world. I have thousands of readers, and and I get these questions in, and I write them down on the notebook, and then in these meditative sessions, I ask these questions and and receive answers, and I estimate that I'm in the eighty. The ninety percent accuracy, uh, so meaning that <laughs> ten or twenty percent of the time I'm I'm not I'm not correct, and it can be because of planetary positions. Um, maybe I'm exhausted from from my day work uh, in the film business or whatever. But um, there are many reasons why. You just don't always receive correctly. West of the Rockies, Daniel's with us, Sonoma County, California. Welcome, Daniel. Go ahead, sir. 
Hello, George, and hello, Tom. Hi. Uh, this is really quite exciting. Yes, um, I am actually uh, a reincarnated Egyptian scribe. Uh huh. Um, I know a lot about Atlantis because I went deeper into that and realized Egypt is from Atlantis. That's where they went. Uh, you probably know this after they uh, you know, okay. crashed each other out. The Lemurians, Atlanteans. And Lemuria, uh, the last part of it that's left is Hawaii, of course. You probably know that Hawaii is the tip of Lemuria. But anyway, moving on, my question for you is, did you know about the healing machines they had in Atlantis that you would just stand in front of and it would clear your auras and heal you instantly? Have you heard of that? Sure, I have. Now, how they did it, I don't know, but I have heard about that. And, by the way, on... On the Egyptian side, um, I I was inspired to create the gentle way uh, back 12,700 years ago on a live on Poseidia, and I had a million followers. But because uh, uh, the there was so much war starting to go on, I and 25,000 of my followers uh, migrated to Egypt, and a, a Egyptian princess helped us settle, and that Egyptian princess is my wife today, and her next life will be as a man back about 12,500 years ago, and he'll be a great leader for his people, and I will be his assistant, which is a past life for me. It gets very complicated. Interesting. Now, how do you get your recollection of past lives, Tom? Oh, I just asked about them. Aha. Uh-huh. So it's not like you dream about it, know about it? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, I write my dreams down every every morning, but um, uh, I just found as I'm asking all these questions, things keep coming up about past lives, and and uh, because I've, I'm supposedly one of only 10 people in the world that have had over 1,000 uh, lives. I'm on my thousand and fifth. Jeez. Uh, Dalai, Dalai Lama is on his eleven hundred. Why do you keep uh, coming back, Tommy? Because they they tell me uh, I'm, I've got three hundred more lives to go, and uh, all these people that are wanting to be leaders of countries want me to be with them to be their advisor. And so, in other lives, I'm advisors to world leaders, but not this life. Holly in Santa Cruz, California. Hi, Holly. Go ahead. Hopefully you're not drowning there. (laughs) Almost. Thank you so much for taking my call. Thank you. I have, um, I have, I would love for uh, you to elaborate on soul contracts. I'm really interested in that. And uh, a couple of my questions is, does everyone have a soul contract? How do you do it? How do you know if you're messing it up? Like what? Okay. Everybody does have a soul contract. The way you stay on your soul contract, because we are uh, we are veiled from from knowing, and we're veiled because we're supposed to learn how to make uh, trillions of deci- uh, decisions a second, like the Creator does. Uh, but that's a longer story. But anyway, uh, we. Uh, if you want to stay on your soul contract, you say, I request a most benevolent outcome. You say this out loud, uh, to stay on my soul contract. Thank you. And then you request benevolent outcomes every day, and it raises your vibrational level at the same time keeping you on your soul uh, contract so you don't go off on a different path that's not as good for your learning. Fascinating how that all works, Tom, isn't it? Yeah. We've got David east of the Rockies in Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, David, let's get you in before the break. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I have a couple of questions here about the aliens, the different types of aliens in general, uh, and the possible uh, star systems. Now, the Palladians are, uh, as I understand, are more like human-like. Is that correct? Some are. Okay, keep in mind there are thousands of planets in the Pleiades. Yeah. So they have they have a variety of, uh, of different-looking people or beings uh, on those planets. And it interests me, like uh, the Orions, that the Egyptians are 
normally uh, associated with. Uh, are they? Do they were like tall? Do they have green skin or what? The Pleiadians? No, or the Orions. What oh. the Egyptians were associated with? Yeah, I I don't know. That's that's not a question I I can answer. In Craig Capabasso's book, he talks about greys, reptilians, hybrids, and Nordiques. Are there others, Tom? Yeah. You know, it, most are, are beyond our, our beliefs. I mean, there are, there are beings that look like they're, they're just attached to the ground, but they're intelligent beings. So how do you classify them? Your contact contacts you telepathy-wise how often? Well, when I do these meditative sessions, they don't, they don't interfere with my normal life. Uh, uh, if you don't do the session, you don't communicate? Right. Interesting take on that. Fantastic. And uh, this documentary that you plan to do aboard a mothership will be done when? I don't know. Uh, I've been told that we're... I'm going to get this invitation so that we'll know and that that I will uh, have to uh, assemble my family at my house and they're going to beam down from the scout ship to my back door and knock on the door back door the four the four team members of this grassroots uh, contact team to introduce themselves. And you'll let us know when it's ready to be viewed. Uh, my daughter and I will have to prepare what's called a pitch deck in in the film industry, and that's something that we will be showing to potential people like the like, like Netflix and stuff like that. Tom, what if they beam you aboard a craft and they keep you? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that isn't going to happen. They, uh, <laughs> it, it's all part of these soul contracts. That's all I. That's all I. So you trust them? It. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's Jeff in Santa Rosa, California. You're our next caller. Hey, Jeffrey, go ahead. Hey, George. Good talking with you again. You too. Thank you. Uh, there was a couple of uh, Pleiad Pleiadians that I spoke with that George interviewed um, months ago, maybe a year or so ago. A vanguard and uh, apparently a mission volunteer out of Oslo, Norway. And I asked them about androids and uh, the weapon systems. I explained a little bit how they lock in place and they have this laser fire. They said they weren't in charge of them. Um, there is a vast army of androids, at least through the United States, and I'm assuming also globally, that use these weapon systems to record information, uh, to invade other people's body, and to um, th that can actually kill. I, since then, I found out that the Greys are the ones that are in charge of the frontline androids and the mission volunteers when the mission volunteers call in for a great offense. And that the mission volunteers, at least the one I am familiar with, uh, also has the same weapon systems. But the body locks a little differently in order to get the, the, the deployment of the fire. I would like to know. Uh, I should add also that the mission volunteers – insert they don't reincarnate neither do any of the pleads they insert and they are this mission volunteers breeding has bred with a real person and re-engineered the dna to get another body container for another mission volunteer to come into that is also weaponized and i would like to get your take on what you know about the androids and the android army that's on Earth, please. Interesting. Okay. Tom, go ahead. That's just not the, the information that I'm receiving, okay? That's not uh, – that would be against the Earth Directive. And um, uh, the, the Zetas took advantage of a hole in the Earth Directive when they were abducting people would match enough to create hybrids. Um, but uh, it, took, it took the Federation of Planets a little while when you've got 20,000 planets that I guess have to approve uh, a, uh, an amendment, but they did, and they no longer can abduct uh, people. 
But that's the only I, – I just don't find any information about androids that would be against the Earth Directive. Sorry. Interesting take. Could he be misled, do you think, Tom? Um, well, gently I would say probably. But, uh, All right, I get it. I get it. Next up, let's go to Alisa in Oregon. Welcome to the program. Hi, Lise. Hi, Tom. Hi, George. Hi. For the more I'm on hold and listen, I have more questions I have. <laughs> Great. So I narrowed it down to two. The first question is, um, you were saying about about pets reincarnating, staying in the pet species. Mm-hmm. There was a guest that George had on a while back who claimed he was a horse in the past life, but he was a human in this life. Are you familiar with that? Well, I am. On uh, Before your first life on Earth, you can have one life as an animal. In my case, I chose a panther in a jungle because my first life was going to be in a jungle. But I've been told that a lot of people choose horses. Um, and I said, well, are any, of, did, are any of them race horses? And I was told if, if they do race, they're generally like fifth or sixth back. They they don't win the race. Why not? <laughs> That's, you know, they're just there to experience Earth and get their feet wet uh, with this these four negative energies and and so that's they're they're doing it an easy way with horses what's your other question lise go ahead my other question is um these uh these palladian ships and whatnot are they actually outside of time and does that tie into the mandela effect and the 12 different I think it's cutting out. Are, they, are they outside of it are they like time traveling machines tom they can travel in time, yes. Okay. Um, but the Mandela effect is something completely different because we're rewriting our past, present, and future all the time, and uh, which is why I have, I have a prayer that I say each, uh, each morning. Uh, I, ask, let's see, I ask any and all beings to aid, comfort, and assist uh, uh, people that have harmed either physically, mentally, morally, spiritually, or emotionally in any past, present, or future life. And I see need all beings to come to the aid and comfort of the families and friends of anyone that I've ever harmed in any way in any past, present, or future life. And supposedly that helps rewrite the past and future because you are uh, in, in some ways hurting other people, whether it be physically or, uh, or some other way in all your lives. So I, I have that little prayer, and it's on my website. At uh, You look under signs at, at my website. All right, let's go to Joshua in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Hey, Josh, go ahead. Hey, how we doing? Uh, great topic. I have a question and uh, a comment. My uh, comment is uh, I almost feel like we are the most attractive things in the universe and maybe the reason why God and the Nephilim come and, uh, you know, take our women. And uh, my question is, and I'll, I'll listen off air, my question is the term old soul, new soul, is there any validity to that? And how are new souls made? If population keeps growing, where are these souls coming from? And if you're a new soul, how are you choosing to be here if You've never been here before, and if population just keeps going bigger and bigger, where are these souls coming from? There's an old Hebrew saying, Tom, of the guff, where souls are kept like a depository. What do you think? Okay. Um, First of all, uh, we are fragments of souls. And as an example, um, uh, there are soul clusters where... There are six to twelve fragments of of a soul having lives on Earth, and um, uh, while our souls are also having five hundred thousand to a million lives all across the universe for their learning, and and there's a reason for that, but it's too long to get into. So, so we're we're these soul fragments, 
and on average, a, a soul fragment will have 600 to 800 lives on Earth. And at this time period, because there are so many people on Earth, 8 billion, we're actually having um, uh, overlapping lives. So as an example, in the 20th century, I know I've had at least five or six um, overlapping lives going on at the same time, and that's probably the way it is for most people, that that we we have these lives because they need, they need to fill the bodies, I guess. Next up, we've got Jesse in Durango, Colorado. Hey, Jess, go ahead. Hi, how are you? We're oh, good. You and Tom doing? Good. Oh, all good, thanks. Um, I wanted to find out if uh, Tom had, had any or seen... The, well, the History Channel had a uh, deal on Atlantis or a continent coming back up off of the base uh, twice in the last 40 years is the only time I've been able to catch it. But the uh, continent is slowly rising up, and it, they had sent uh, a diver, the small unmanned to dive unit down to see uh, what was going on and found uh, structures and craft and whatnot and wondered if he had heard anything about that or if the combination of the two with that as well as yeah. it coming up because it's like 800 plus thousand Yes. We're miles that's coming up. But, right. But the, uh, you know, the continent itself broke up uh, completely except for, like, the Canary Islands and uh, the Bahamas and, uh, and Bermuda. Uh, it, it broke completely apart. So, I mean, it was in, it's in pieces. So I don't see that continent ever rising again. That's, that's maybe a nice story, but I... I just don't think that's going to happen. All right. Let's take a few more calls here as we still have a little bit of time left. Let's go next to Stephen in Greenwater, Washington. Stephen, go ahead, sir. Hi, guys. Hey, Stephen. I'm curious. I want to ask your guest about Bigfoot, if he knows anything about Bigfoot, and if so, uh, any of the other cryptids connected to missing hunters and campers and hikers, and they're not friendly. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, and you could go on my website to that articles and news page, and you type in Bigfoot or type in uh, Sasquatch, and, and and you'll find I've I've asked a lot of questions. It uh, I understand that they're able to shift dimensions, and which is why. We don't see them very often. They're they're pretty shy um, uh, beings, and um, and they're they're just able to shift away and and not be where we can we can see them very often. So I don't know a lot about them, but I have. If you go there, I have asked some questions, but I've I've asked so many questions over a time period. I don't remember. That's another book by itself, Tom, isn't it? Yeah. Questions I've asked. Melissa in Middletown, Connecticut. Hey, Melissa, welcome to the program. Hello. Thank Hi. you so much. I literally sit after work. I work overnight, and I sit in my car to listen to you Well, all the time. thank you. Don't fall asleep. And, no, no. No, it's too late to fall asleep at this point. But I am so interested this whole subject i have so many questions and i think it all leads down to to one basic thing you were talking about that you understand your wife is going to be someone else in another life and as will you so yeah. at least you need to believe this whole continuous time everything happens all at once but yet how can we go back to visit let's say past loved ones that we have left in the past and still lead a future life while choosing our souls when, from my understanding, we can go to any planet or anywhere we want. So 
how does that all connect into one soul? Okay. Like one our, our souls volunteered for the Earth experiment. So our soul fragments are having these 600 to 800 lives on Earth. And, and you can go, uh, you can have these lives, uh, go, you can go back to the past and have one, um, or you can go uh, forward. My next life on Earth will be in the 3400 era where I'm going to be a female space pilot. But after that, I'm going to go back to 2600 era uh, to prepare people uh, for, for interplanetary travel and then back to the 3400 era for another life there. But then a even after that, I go back and I'm going to have some lives back in the 20th uh, century where I'm going to be an advisor to uh, uh, to a couple of religious leaders. So, Tom, are you prepared for just about anything with these ETs? Well, I'm trying to. <laughs> That's that, that's all you all you can do is just say, "Hey, uh, I know I'm going to be uh, godsmacked." I guess would be the word um, in uh, in seeing this, but but I've got a job to do, and that's that's my soul contract. So I'm going to do it the best I can. Do you think your life has been leading up to this point? Oh yeah, yeah. As I was told. Back in November, December, well, Tom, uh, uh, you know, 2023 is here, and now the real work begins. When you were a little boy, did you have any of these episodes with ETs? No. None at all? I don't remember if I did. But you sure have them now. Yeah, and again, this new this newsletter is basically a conversation with the ET, isn't it? Well, not only Antura, but I also uh, ask questions each week of Gaia, the soul of the Earth. I ask all the Earth questions, like I, in this past uh, newsletter that's just going out now. I ask for an update on Yellowstone. Uh, it's still a seventy three percent probability that it, the volcano is going to explode. And on the uh, West Coast uh, earthquakes, it's still sitting at 63%. It's been that way for about a year. And it'll happen indeed. Tom, thanks. Keep in touch. Let us know about that documentary aboard the uh, mothership, okay? Will do. Thank you. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.